Amen. All right, now we're preaching through our doctrinal statement, and one of which is that we are we are a post-trib pre-wrath church. And last week on Sunday evening, I introduced the end times timeline, looking at the prophecy timeline in a, in a general overview, just kind of going from before the time of tribulation begins to the time of tribulation through the wrath, God's millennial kingdom, and then to the new heaven and new earth. And we just sort of skimmed the surface. It was just an overview to help place some events on the timeline. And today, this morning, we're going to go through the, the tribulation of the saints, which is really, the majority of it is the seven seals of Revelation. Yeah. And that's why we're in Revelation chapter 7, or 6 rather. Look at verse number 1. It says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now we're going to primarily be in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24 this morning. So find your place in both of those. And go ahead and also turn to Revelation 12 for a moment. We're going to take a glance there. But to introduce what we're looking at here, in the seven seals of Revelation, the first one we've introduced is when the Antichrist comes to earth. The Bible teaches there comes a point where the devil is no longer permitted in heaven. He's cast out of heaven. And that's when the Antichrist begins his reign. The Antichrist begins to pour out his wrath upon the earth. And more specifically, he goes to war with the saints, with the believers, with the Christians. And it's, it's introduced as being a white horse. You've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And there's white, red, black, and pale. And these were actually introduced in Zechariah 6 in the Old Testament. So revelation is given to us to reveal the mystery. What Zechariah spoke about a lot of times was mysterious. What Isaiah and Daniel spoke about in the, in the end times was very mysterious. The book of Revelation was given to clear things up, to reveal the truth, to reveal the mystery and help give us the answer and the understanding. Um, in Daniel 7 it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for a time and times and the dividing of time. And time represents a, a year. So it's time, times, and the dividing of time. So the seven seals, this is a three and a half year period we see here up until the point of the return of the Lord. There are several other places that teach this same number. We'll look at a few of them. You're in Revelation chapter 12. I want you to look at verse number 7. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So we probably heard, you know, all the devils. The devil goes to and fro in the earth. But the devil is not in hell. The devil is not king over hell. He's not partying down in hell. The devil has no power in hell. When the Lord takes away the devil's power, where does he put him? In hell. That's right. So it's not that the, the hell is, is the devil's kingdom or anything like that. But what begins to happen here is as Lucifer, as it said in Isaiah 14, rebels against God and he begins to cause this war in heaven. God has his angels, Michael, fighting against him. And there comes a point finally where God is filled up. He's full of it. There comes a point where the abominations are come full on earth. These things happen at the same time. And God casts the devil out of heaven. He's no longer in heaven. He's no longer accusing the brethren daily. You think about what this is saying here. When I sin, now that I'm saved, I will not go to hell. Amen. I am free from the bondage of sin in the sense of the payment for sin has already been made. Yeah. Amen. Hey, I'm still going to sin. I still will be corrected by the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. I will, right. I will endure correction. Okay, oh, yeah. I will be chastised because I'm His Son and not a bastard. Amen. But now the devil will not be able to accuse me before the Father, which there's Jesus as our advocate. He's defending us. He's saying, hey, what about my blood? And there's the devil. Hey, what about his sin? And Jesus says, hey, what about my blood? Right? right? Amen. I paid that price. Well, listen, things make a transition here. The devil who has been at war, both in heaven and on earth for a long time, is no longer in heaven. 
This spiritual warfare that we endure today as Christians is now ramped up to a whole nother level. And he knows that he has a short time, it says. And so for the next three and a half years, the devil, through the power of the Antichrist and his new world order, will really begin to change things on earth. Look, we left off. Look at verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Hey, I'm not here just for this flesh and body. I'm here for the soul, for the spirit, for the ministry of reconciliation we've been given about preaching the Gospel. And it says we overcome the devil and his attacks by our testimony, and our testimony is this, of the blood of Jesus Christ. So when He accuses us, we claim the blood. We speak of the blood. Look, He says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. Why? Because there's no, there's no war in heaven anymore. And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Yeah. Go to Revelation 13. Look, the devil is going to pour his wrath out on Christians before the Lord returns. This is something the Bible clearly teaches in many different places. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in My name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. The devil will persecute Christians. And he begins. the devil begins his ministry, if you will. He begins his attacks at the beginning with the first seal, what we read in Revelation 6. He will persecute Christians before the Lord returns. And you have to stop and ask, why would God allow the devil to persecute Christians. It's kind of a strange thing. Why would God do this? But you know, maybe another question to ask is, why did God allow His Son to be persecuted by the devil? Right? It was for His glory. And in the yeah. same way, for our salvation, Jesus suffered. Now, we are going to suffer. The Bible says that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Yeah, right. Hey, we're going to go through tribulation on the earth. And we're going to go through suffering. And then we will be glorified in His image also. Yeah. Jesus told us that in the world ye shall have tribulation. Right. Right. We're going to have rough times down here. It's not just flowers and rainbows for Christians. Once you're saved, that doesn't mean life becomes perfect. Honestly, it means, hey, guess what? Now the devil's going to attack you. He wants to get you to stumble and fall. But you know, the Lord allows that so that we become tempered. We become stronger in the Lord and that we know that we have confidence in Him. We know that we need to go to Him when times are tough. Yeah. And it's interesting because we're actually going to go through similar things during the time of tribulation as what Jesus went through in His tribulation building up to the cross. You think about it, there was temptation and distress. He was, he was forsaken by friends and family. He was betrayed, right? And Jesus warned us of all of these things. He was beaten and scourged. And the Bible warns us that those similar things will happen to us yeah. during this great tribulation. Yeah, that's good. Right? There's, yeah. there's going to be suffering and shame. And it's interesting because last week we read Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is where Jesus outlines this time of tribulation. Then Matthew 25 is where Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. He gives us several parables about how we are servants and we ought to be serving. We want to be found as good servants. And then the very next chapter in 26 is where Jesus prophesies and tells them, I will be crucified, I will be put to death, and I will rise again. Preaching the Gospel. Hey, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Jesus foretelling this thing, these things to His disciples. And in Matthew 26, I want to read you two verses because there's two types of disciples that we need to be careful that we are not these types of disciples during the time of tribulation. In Matthew 26, 41, He says, Watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Now this was speaking to the disciples that Jesus had said, watch and pray with Me. Could you not watch and pray for one hour? Could you not just be vigilant and be on guard? And Jesus is warning us that one of the ways the devils will cause tribulation in our life is through temptation of the flesh. He's going to get us to try to do things that we ought not to do to get us out of our ministry, to get us out of serving the Lord and preaching. So don't be asleep. We need to be alert. We need to be on guard. 
Another, in, in verse 52 of that same chapter, Jesus said unto them, put, a, put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Don't be one of these Christians that has a bug out mentality. I'm going to go hide in the hills. I'm going to store up my guns. I'm counting on my food to get me through it. Hey, it's a good thing to have a gun and protect your house. It's a good thing yeah. to have extra food in case of a time of trouble. But look, our confidence is not in prepping. Our confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you trust in this bug out mentality, Jesus is saying you're going to die by the sword. Yeah. I've met a lot of Christians with this attitude and it's like, well, the more guns I get, the safer I am. No, the more your heart is in line with Jesus' heart, the safer you're going to be. I mean, you can pass right through a crowd and no man will touch you, just as Jesus did. And we need to remember this going into the time of tribulation. Don't have this knee-jerk reaction to just start shooting you know, or being ready. Oh, here they come. I'm going to get them. No, we don't fight in the flesh. This is spiritual warfare. And during this time, although they will be putting us to death, it yeah. says they may be torturing us and putting us before councils. It is not our place to resist with arms. It's our place to preach the gospel. This is what God wants from us. Amen. Yeah. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We are appointed unto afflictions. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer persecution. Are we going to be like Christ to the full extent? We will suffer. We are appointed unto persecution and tribulation. We, are. we must go through this tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God, is what we're told. Amen. Now you're there in Revelation chapter 13. Find verse number 7. And it was given unto Him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given Him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Think about what this is saying here. The whole world is going to say we're crazy because we're not worshiping the Antichrist right. as God. They are. Hey, they can call us crazy. They can do what they want. Amen. In Daniel 11, we were warned of this, and it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. This man is not only going to proclaim himself king, but he's going to proclaim himself as God. He's going to demand that you worship Him as God. You're still in Revelation 13. Look at verse 16. And He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Notice it's in. If your Bible doesn't say in their forehead or in their hand, you need to throw it away. It's wrong. It's going to be inside. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. In other words, six, six, six. Now turn back to Revelation 6. So as this begins to play out, and the Antichrist comes down, Satan will use the Antichrist and also the false prophet. Both of these men are called beasts. The Antichrist is called a beast, and then it says, I saw another beast. And this beast, this false prophet, does miracles. He causes fire to come down from heaven. He does miracles in the sight of men so that people would question, huh, well, maybe, huh. You know, and it's interesting because in Deuteronomy it gave us this warning. It talked about if there be a false prophet that comes and he, and he says something and it comes true, the Lord is allowing it to test you, to try you, to see if you're really going to serve the Lord or if you're going to serve Baal. And that's essentially what's going to happen. The Bible warns about a great falling away where people will say, but you saw, we all saw that miracle. He must be God. Because the guy that did the miracle then pointed to the Antichrist. And that's what's going to happen. In this time, the mark of the beast, there will be a ramp up where the mark of the beast will be introduced. It says it will be 666. I believe there's a good possibility it will be related to what is called the seal of Solomon or the star of David. 
This is not a biblical symbol. Amen. This is not of God. Right. In witchcraft, this is called a hexagram. Right. Witchcraft, they want to put a hex on people. And this is what the Freemasons and Judaism of today, right. notice the religion of Judaism, it's not a racial thing. This is a practice of religion. Right. They practice witchcraft. Yeah. And that's why they use this symbol. The Bible calls them the idol shepherd. We're going to look at that. But So it builds up toward this eventual abomination of desolation. And this mark of the beast will be introduced as a means of control. Now you're in Revelation 6, right? I'm going to read you. In Zechariah 8, it says, For before these days there was no hire for a man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men one against his neighbor. This time of trouble is going to be neighbors against each other, family against each other. And it says there's no hire for a man. I mean, this is going to destroy the economy. And that's where their financial system will include the 666 to buy and to sell. They are in control of the money. Your, your money is fiat currency. That means it has value based on what somebody spoke into existence. Hey, and they're not God, okay? God speaks things into existence, not the International Monetary Fund, not the Rothschilds, okay? Not the devil. He doesn't have this power. But even the money that we have that's printed is based on a fractional reserve system, which means what real money exists is deposited in the bank, and then they can lend out 11 times more what they actually have on hand. Our money is an illusion already. Right. Yeah. And now credit cards have this chip in it. Yeah. And it's always going to speed things up. Nope. Who has a credit card with a chip? Yeah. How, isn't it slower than the old style credit card? Yeah. Right? Yeah. But where is this going? What are they preparing us for? But the mark of the beast. Right. They want to put a chip in your forehead or in your hand right. as a means of control. But one of the things that it said was that they worship the beast. Right. They, they are going to worship the Antichrist. It's not just putting an RFID chip in your arm. Whatever the mark of the beast is will include worshiping this man as God. Yes. And that's wicked as hell. Look in Revelation 6, look at verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword. Now, keeping your finger here, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. So, the second seal is this red horse. And this is probably going to look like World War III. This is probably what everybody's anticipating. World War everywhere. And it's weird because right now there's hundreds of military corrective actions, whatever you want to call them, a United Nations action or whatever they want to call it. I mean, there's already war all across the globe. But I believe this will be to a whole other level of where here, even in America, there will be war in the streets. This will be world war across the entire world. This is, I believe, the World War III that everybody is looking for, which oddly enough was pre-programmed and, and, and pre-prophesied of the Freemasons. They want to have three world wars ultimately to put Lucifer on the throne is their own statement. That's right. And this is the goal. This is what we see in the book of Revelation. Now in Matthew 24, look at verse number 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now go to Revelation 6. Hey, now Jesus was a man acquainted with sorrow. When Jesus went through His tribulation, He was sorrowful. He had tears, sorrowful unto death. Yeah. But you know, He laid His life down for us. There was this yeah. cup, and He said, Lord, if it be Your will, right? But what did He do? He took that cup. Yeah. He laid His life down for us because He loves us. Right. And in the same way, when this begins to happen on the earth, we have to recognize that it's like there's a stopwatch that's began. It's game on. Your house, your car, your career, these things no longer matter. What matters is souls won for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your friends and your family, this may be your last opportunity to actually get them into heaven. And if you don't take it seriously, if you're more worried about building your bunker, 
then guess what? Souls will go to hell. On your watch, there may be blood on your hands. So here at the tail end of what we read in Matthew, it talks about famines and pestilences. In Revelation 6, look at verse number 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou, hurt not the oil and the wine. So in the Bible, a penny is referenced as a day's wage. Can you imagine a cup full of, of barley, a cup full of oats, right? A cup full of food for what a day's wage would be, $100, $200. Can you imagine that? You work a 12-hour day and you come home with not even enough food to feed yourself, let alone your family. This is going to be a time of great distress upon the earth. Oh, yeah. In Luke 21, it says, it says, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. This is going to be a wild time to be living in. But you know what? Many of us, if it happens in our lifetime, many of us may die through it. And that's okay. This body is not the end game. It's your soul that matters. Now, in, back in Revelation 6, Look at verse number 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth, fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And he followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Can you imagine one-fourth of the Earth's population dying? Now, mind you, this is already after the wars and the rumors of wars. This is already after the pestilences, the lack of food, people starving and dying from starvation. And then whatever is left there, a fourth of them are destroyed. A fourth of the people die. This is the Antichrist's destructive kingdom as he pours out his wrath on this world. In Zechariah 11, it says, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that is broken, nor feed that standeth still. But he shall eat of the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm, and his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And Zechariah, the idle shepherd, this is talking about the Antichrist. Because here in a minute we're going to look at it where it talks about the abomination of desolation, which is nothing more than an idol. He is this idle shepherd. But you know what? Deliverance is coming after the affliction. Amen. We have something to look forward to. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he tells us, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, or by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Hey, be not deceived. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. When people say Jesus can come back at any moment, they're lying. They're deceiving. There are things that must play out on this earth. The devil and the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to pour out their wrath and their deception and the mark of the beast. Many Christians will die. But it's okay. God's in charge. He has a plan. And whether we live through it or die in it, it's for God's glory. That's the attitude we need to have. Look, he says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away fit first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So again, the Antichrist must come before the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about it. People, oh, a false Christ... How could a false Christ come after Jesus? Yeah. If Jesus had already yeah. split the sky and revealed Himself, and everybody says, whoa, that's God. Whoa, that's the Lamb. That's the yeah. Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And then a man could deceive us and say He's Christ? It's foolishness. Yes. Right. It's the cart before the horse, right? Yeah. Yes. The Antichrist will come first. He will say, I am the Christ that everyone spoke of. Yeah. I am the Maitreya. I am Buddha. I am all these other gods wrapped into one. 
I have a Christ consciousness and you too can be a God. He's going to preach the New Age Gospel. But yet He's going to demand worship and He's going to control the earth. Look, He says, "...who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." Again, this man, the son of perdition, will claim to be God. Now you're in Revelation 6. Let's look at verse number 9. It's the fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren should be killed as they were, it should be fulfilled. Now go back to Matthew 24. So here he's saying the tribulation saints, the believers that die during this period. There's a short period here where we have the great tribulation, where we have this is all tribulation, and then we have a small period of great tribulation where it really ramps up. And, and it may be that the mark of the beast is recommended through all these troubles where there's no food, you can always go get the mark. There's no food, you can always worship the beast. But then I believe there comes a point where it's mandated. It's yeah. not just a recommendation. Yeah, it's a command of the devil right. to come down and get his mark on your forehead. Right. And people will die because of it, because they refuse it. And yet the Lord calls it a time of rest for those that die. He says, rest yet for a little season. Yeah. It's okay. God will comfort your soul. God will comfort your heart. In Mark 13, he says, but take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Sounds like what Jesus went through, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. When it says published, that means preached. Amen. We verbally publish it. We are preaching the gospel in every nation. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. God will give you the words. You may be facing a death sentence, and they're going to put you on trial. They're going to use your words against you. Hey, the Bible says you shall be justified by your words, right? Or you'll be yeah. condemned. Right. And that goes for sinners. That goes for people that think they can work their way to heaven. God's saying, hey, by your own words will be held against you, and it will be proof that you did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Yep. And in the same way, that standard will be held against us. Yep. We're going to stand before trials in synagogues. A synagogue, really? In the end times? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, and there are synagogues growing all across America, but there's going to be... It's in, in Daniel, it talks about that the Antichrist will build his temple between the holy mountains. Right? Yeah. In the glorious city. Where's that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? The Antichrist will rule from Jerusalem. Look, he says, And brothers shall betray the brother to death, and the father and the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. Hey, I love what Brother, what brother Grant said, that children are arrows. Right? God says your children are like a, a quiver full of arrows so you can go to war with the enemy. Right? And yet the devil will use those arrows as fiery darts against you if you don't raise them for the Lord now. You send your children to a public school. You send your children to a fake church because they have a great program. You don't teach your children yourself. You let your children watch TV as a babysitter. You might as well just hand it to the devil and say, use this as a fire arrow and shoot me in the back when the devil's attacking. And that's what will be betrayed by our own family. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he shall endure to the end. The same shall be saved. That's talking about fleshly salvation. Right. Being alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord is what it's speaking of. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. So where is this abomination of desolation going to be? In Judea, right. You're in Matthew 24. Look at verse number 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. 
And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So when they're talking about this abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of, in Daniel 9, in the beginning of the chapter, it begins to talk about the desolations of Jerusalem. And in verse 27, the famous verse, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that, that shall, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Alright, so the midst of the week. Again, this week represents years. There is a week of years. There's a seven year period. And today we're looking at half of this week. We're looking at the three and a half years. And in the midst of the week, we're going to see this abomination of desolation. Yeah. In Daniel 11, it says that He will pollute the sanctuary of strength. <coughs> and take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Yep. So there's an indication that there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem, and they're going to have a sacrifice. Now if this happened tomorrow, literally tomorrow if there's an announcement, doo -doo, doo -doo, right? Yeah. The temple of the Lord has returned. Send money now, right? They're going to send all manner of gold and silver and beasts to be sacrificed to Jerusalem. These things will be sent to Jerusalem. John Hagee will be advocating, yeah, yeah, yeah. send a goat through John Hagee. Send your money and John Hagee will mail a goat for you. Right? John Hagee is a goat. <laughs> Look, in Luke 21 he says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Jerusalem will become desolate when the Antichrist is done with what he's doing here. Then them which be in Judea flee in the mountains, and them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them which are in the countries enter thereinto. Don't go to Jerusalem is what it's saying. Now go to, go to Revelation 6. It's interesting because I had somebody a few years ago try to tell me, well, all I know is when, it's, when the end times are here, I'm going to Jerusalem because that's going to be the safest place in the world. And I'm thinking, man, you've been watching too many of these Judaizers on TBN who are telling you that you know all oh, Jerusalem's always going to be preserved and protected. Hey, there's coming a point for that. There's coming a point we're going to look at that next week where the Lord's going to step in. But this isn't it. This is not it. If you're saved during the time of tribulation, that's the one place you're told to get out of. Okay? In Luke 21 he says, "But woe unto them that are with child and that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land." and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Once the Antichrist kingdom is over, then God turns it on them. He begins to pour out His wrath. It will be poured upon the desolate, it said. In Zechariah 12, it says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. In Zechariah 14, he says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. It's going to be a terrible place to be at that time. But you know what? We don't have to worry about that. Hey, we're not worried about Jerusalem. We're about our, our own Jerusalem here in Jacksonville. Let's worry about our city and the souls in Jacksonville. Let's get some people saved here so that we're not outnumbered in this time of tribulation. Here in Revelation 6, look at verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth as a fig tree casting her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Can you imagine that? The heaven departing as a scroll? You know, when I was...
putting this map of the United States with all the preachers on it, when I was putting this up, I would open it and then I let go and it, it rolled back together. Yeah. Can you imagine the, the heavens itself, the cosmos, our sky just rolling up like a map and God sticking his head in. <laughs> it's going to be a scary day for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> Look, he says in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens of the rocks and the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand. So as all these things take place, as we get to this last part here, and look, we saw where the devil's coming down. This is where Jesus comes down. The sun and the moon will be darkened. And the second coming, this is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Bible teaches three separate comings. He came first as a baby, as our Savior, right? Yep. He comes second as the Lord, returning to resurrect the saints. But then yet, there is a third coming. And we'll look at that probably next week also. Now, you're in Matthew 24, right? So when it talks about the sun, moon, and the stars being darkened, we see this in Joel 2, Joel 3. We see it in Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24. There's a lot of places that deal with the sun, moon, and the stars being darkened. There's also a lot of references to the resurrection. In Luke 21, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So literally, people are going to be having heart attacks because of the tribulation. The things that the devil does is going to scare people to death. And yet God says, they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. And the flip side of that coin is we're, we're saved. So when it gets really scary here, this earthquake, the sun, moon, and the stars, we're going to say, here it comes. Here am I, Lord. Right? I'm ready. And yet the rest of the earth is going to be scared to death. Amen. The wrath of the Lamb is about to come upon them. They're going to know that the things that have been going on that they've supported are wrong and against the God of heaven, the God that created everything, right. and He's come for revenge. In Mark 13, He says, But take heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. In those days after that tribulation, those after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then shall He send His angels and shall gather together His elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. The famous chapter in 1 Thessalonians 4, He says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The resurrection is called the coming of the Lord. Yep. It's not called something different. It's not a secret. Every eye will see Him. Zechariah says they will see Him and they pierced. It was partially fulfilled at the, at the death of Jesus, at the crucifixion, and it will be fulfilled at His return. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and, there, and, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now in Daniel 12 it says, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. We're going to talk a little bit in one of the next sermons about the likeness of our resurrected body. In 1 Corinthians 15, it gives us a glimpse of it and it talks about their bodies terrestrial, right? Terrain. We're on the earth. We're earthly. We are made of dirt, right? Bunch of dirty humans. Right? <laughs> but it says that our glory will be celestial. 
we will have a celestial glory as if the clouds, as of the angels, as of Jesus Christ Himself, more yeah. specifically. In Daniel 7, He tells us, in the night visions, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given Him dominion and, gl and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom in that which shall not be destroyed. So there's going to be a time when the Lord, He's going to pour out His wrath. He will establish a kingdom. We're going to take a look at all that. All these things have been foretold. And sometimes in Daniel, you read one verse and the next verse, and there's like there's not even a breath in between the two, but yet in God's timeline, there may be several years. And we're going to try to help make that discernible. You're in Matthew 24. Find your way to verse number 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them, I'm sorry, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. This is such a, a terrible time. He's saying if you're on top of your roof, run. Don't even come down and go in the house to get something. If you're in the field, run. Get out of the city. It's about to be destroyed. He said, And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray not that your flight be in winter. I'm sorry, that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The Lord is said, well, giving some very clear instructions here about what may happen. It may be on the Sabbath day. It may be in the winter. And the women with children in the city, because it's hard to run with children, they may lose their life that are in Jerusalem. But pray ye that... I'm sorry, verse 21. For, when, for then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall ar arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show you great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. So look, again, looking at the timeline here, when the martyrs, when we begin to have Christians killed for not following this false, this false prophet pointing at the Antichrist, it's a great time of people dying. It's scary. But you know what? The Lord is our confidence. And I don't tell you these things to scare you. Jesus said He tells us these things so we wouldn't be offended. Yeah. When it happens, don't be taken by surprise. Don't be like uh, one of these pre-tribbers that are like the disciples that were sleeping while Jesus is going through trials. They're sleeping and then all of a sudden, what? There's, so, there's, there's soldiers here. They want to take us away. What? How did this come upon us? Hey, be vigilant. Be on guard. Amen. Behold, I have told you before. Verse 25. Look at 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, He is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and it shineth even unto the west, so shall also the, sun, the coming of the Son of Man be. For whithersoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So immediately after the tribulation, this great period of tribulation is ended by the sun and the moon darkened, right? By what the Lord is about to do. Because the Antichrist can't darken the moon. He can't darken the sun. He can't cause the stars fall down from heaven. Look, he says in verse 31, here's our redemption. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Go back to Revelation chapter 6. 
So God tells us this so that we know what's happening. When we see these things that begin to take place, we're supposed to know. We're supposed to register in our heart. Whoa, this is what God talked about. Yeah. We're not, don't be a, like the preacher. Oh, uh, you know, that's just that's not it. Right. <laughs> don't fall in love with Donald Trump and think he's your savior. Amen. Right? <laughs> right. Look at verse 14, Revelation 6, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Is this a small, insignificant event? No. Is this something every human being is going to notice? Yeah. Yeah. You think this will get their attention? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now look at Revelation 7. Flip ahead to Revelation chapter 7. Mm -hmm. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Verse 10, And I cried and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God, forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? He's saying, where, Who are these people and where did they come from? There's a great multitude that no man could number. The Bible numbers some big numbers. People can count some amazing numbers. But here he says, No man is capable of numbering these numbers. It's like there's not enough time in your human life to count these numbers. Right? I don't know, what can a, can a person not count to 10 billion in their lifetime? I don't know what this number is, but I want you to think about how great it is. He says it's from all kindreds and nations and tongues. There are kindreds and nations and tongues that no longer exist. This is the resurrection of the saints. He says, Where, whence came they? Where did they come from? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now flip ahead to Revelation 14. This is the last place we're going to go this morning. Revelation chapter 14. Verse number 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the crowd, on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the, the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle to the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So this last parallel here, we see where during the resurrection, the saints are brought up from the earth and everybody else that's on the earth goes into the day of the wrath of the Lamb. Right? The day of the Lord is at hand. It's a day of great wrath. It's a day of distress. A day of darkness. A gloomy day. Yeah. There will be many people in the next sermon that we talk about in the day of wrath, we're going to see a lot of people dying when God pours out His wrath. Right. The people that die are those that have accepted this mark of the beast, that have worshipped the image. And yet, God will, will leave a remnant. There will be people that will be born during this time there will be people that are unsaved that make it through all of this, and yet they are not destroyed. 
So even though we hear of all this distress and destruction and tribulation and troubles, there will be people that live through all of this. Yeah. It'll be a small remnant, but God uses it for a purpose. You know, and so it begins with the Antichrist. We come to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We will be resurrected. And then God begins to pour out His wrath on the earth. He begins to pour out judgment. And listen, there are different judgments. We're going to look at the judgments also next week. How the judgment seat of Christ, the reward of the Christians, of the saints that get resurrected. There's also the great white judgment throne when the, when the Lord God Almighty judges the wicked. When He judges the devil himself, the false prophet and the beast. Everyone will be judged for their works. And hey, as Christians, as believers, our works have already been eliminated in that sense. Now we just have to worry about working for reward. Yeah. We're going to yeah. touch on that a little bit next week. But one of the biggest things I want you to get from this again is that we are called through this time to preach the Gospel. It's the Amen. tribulation of the saints. It's the war on the saints. It's the wrath of the dragon. It's the seven seals. And through all of this, God wants us to have confidence in Him. Right. Knowing that we're going to have a resurrection. Knowing that we're going to have redemption. And when Jesus went through His sufferings and His trials, that was a picture of what we're going to go through. Yep. We're going to have a tough time. We're going to see family members against us. Wow. We're going to see family members die. Yep. And that's okay. Settle it in your hearts. God has a plan. And even now, you know, if it's several years away, don't be discouraged at the, at the tribulations you go through now. When you start going through a tough time, when you're discouraged and you're thinking, why, Lord, it doesn't make sense. I don't understand why I have to deal with this. Think about what Jesus went through for right. you. Amen. For your yeah. salvation. Yeah, because in the resurrection, Jesus' enemies recognized. I mean, there was a great earthquake. There was a resurrection in Jesus' resurrection. Very similar to what we have here. And His enemies that watched all this happen, they said, whoa, He was God. Yeah. And the same thing will happen. These people that scoff and say we're, that we're wrong, there's going to come a point where they're going to say, whoa, there is a God in heaven. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And they've messed up. They're going to know it. Yeah. So God is just. Our redemption is nigh, but it's not at hand. This day is not yet. There are many things that are going to come first. So comfort yourselves. And know that the Lord loves us. That's why He wants us to go through it to glorify Him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the free gift of salvation. Lord, we love You. We love this church. I pray You would continue to send more laborers here, Lord. Send some people that want to change their life and become soul winners for You.